I'm delighted to be joined by Ewan Campbell, the Head of Whiskey Creation at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and Julian Williams, who is the Spirits Coordinator. And we're going to be looking at what is in store for members in the March outturn, basically what's going to be available for members to buy uh, in the UK at least. Uh, so, you know, we talk with Ewan every month about what's coming out and we thought we would just record this to capture his thoughts and Julian's as well. Uh, so, you know, we, we have a theme for each month and in March we're really looking at thinking differently, which kind of ties in with the society's 40th anniversary. Uh, we've got a maverick theme throughout the course of the year to celebrate the society and how we do things differently. And I have to say, guys, looking at the whiskey list, the outturn for March, there's a lot in there which leaps out as kind of being a bit different. Uh, so shall we dive in? What's, what captures your eye, Ewan? Well, where do you start? Yeah, good um, question. Yeah, there's a lot on the go here. Um, I'd probably am drawn initially to deep rich and dried fruits flavour profile and there's kind of a heavy hitting combo in here, very intense, where we've got heavy spirit, so kind of um, on that kind of meaty side of uh, distillate, matched with sherry wood, so that would be the 78, 68 and the 1853. And I really like this kind of robust style that you get from those two things combined. You like an old funky butt? Old funky butt, yeah. It's kind of a, what's that, like Chaucer style. <laughs> <laughs> it's written. Um, yeah, and then uh, the other one, the 18, is called Subtle Nut Brittle in a Bottle, which is a bit of a tongue twister. Yeah, nice. So definitely ticking the deep, rich and dried fruit boxes. Yeah, Julian? Yeah, speaking of those two... Um, if you look at 7868, as you mentioned, it's a butt. So you get the opportunity to compare um, quite similar sort of maturations, but one being in a hogshead and the other one in a butt. So it's a difference of volume right there. And although the distance are, are different, you would probably uh, really enjoy that comparison. Yeah. For, yeah, for your sherry fans, quite a lot to choose from there. Uh, Pretty robust stuff as well, I think. Uh, a very interesting new distillery coming out in March. Uh, 155.1, the Rye Pretender. Tell us about that, Ewan. Yeah, so very excited to see this one. Um, it's been quite a long time coming. <laughs> uh, importing is not very easy these days, so getting it over here was, was a bit of a challenge. But yeah, brilliant to see it coming out now. Um, quite young, uh, four years old, but um, it's matured in quite a hot climate. And we've got um, a really nice STR, Shaved Toast Rechar Barrique. So really dark colour very rich and really manageable. It's quite a high strength as well. Um, but yeah, lovely stuff. Another example of, you know, how great world whiskey can be. Yeah, and we don't, obviously, at the society, we don't talk specifically about distillery names, but we can say this one comes from Israel and it's a first for the society. Uh, you had a chance to try it, Julian? Uh, I don't think I've tried this one, but I think you could sensibly expect something that is along the line of what we get from this 3134 when it comes to maturation when you have a uh, very high loss through a very well few years essentially which ends up with a really flavorsome and concentrated whiskey which is um, a very very interesting um, sort of maturation compared to what we have in Scotland where it's, um, it's much more of the the long game, really. Yeah, yeah, it kept quite a rapid maturation in the in this really climate. Uh, you and you mentioned shave, toast, and rechar. You want to just give us a wee bit more on what that means? Yeah, so this is where you can get some extra life from uh, a, a wine barrique. So normally they're American oak uh, red wine casks that are then taken apart. Each stave gets shaved to take off three millimetres, which exposes new new fresh oak. Um, toasted for maybe 20 to 40 minutes, unlocks a lot of the flavours, and then there's a wee bit of char, maybe 40 seconds or so at a much higher temperature, um, which gives you that 
extra benefit of a, a layer of active charcoal as well. Um, tend to give a really lovely deep colour from the toasting. Um, yeah, great, but very fruity uh, notes that they contribute. And it's a lovely distillate as well. Very fruity in style when you pair it with this type of cask. It, th this type of cask is quite um, often used with, with younger releases. Yeah. So we've seen it from a lot of the newer distilleries. It's, it's quite a popular choice and it works very well. Yeah, it's like a Dr. Jim Swan innovation really, wasn't it? The, yeah. the, the new distilleries he was working with. Absolutely, uh, to, yeah. from Taiwan to yeah. uh, Wales, all, all over <laughs> this, this type of cask is used. Yeah, okay, definitely one to look out for. 155.1. Uh, the Rye Pretender. A uh, couple of heavily peated uh, bottlings in this outturn, and we don't see so many in that flavour profile category. Uh, what do you make of these ones, Julian? Well, one of them is definitely going to be a very popular choice, but I would say the other one is really has merit, and it's been... It's been highly lauded by uh, by the panel for its characteristics as a one heavily peated but also heavily sherried malt. So if you're into that kind of combination of flavors, it, it certainly will speak to you. Is this the number ten dot two four four? Yeah, indeed it is. Uh, olives and bacon have a fight. Yeah, have a good name. It sounds entertaining. Yeah, you can smell the brine. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, heavily peated from an Oloroso hogshead, right? Uh, and uh, and the twenty nine two nine zero, I guess the name for that one says it all. Love it slash hate it. What do you think of that one? Well, I, I would obliterate the end because everyone's <laughs> going to love it. I don't know. It's, it's more of a. No, beet is a bit of a, an acquired taste for some of, some whiskey drinkers. It was the case for me. Now I'm I'm fully fully into the peat team, but it used to be a much, a much harder choice for me. Yes, but probably not your entry level peat, you know, if it's, uh, if it's heavily peated uh, and, and it's that medicinal, you know, iodine type style of peatiness. Yeah, which then this, this is going, definitely going to be with that, that kind of, um, the kind of Isla peat that's being used for this. You, can, you, you should expect quite a bit in um, <clears throat> medicinal flavours and um, maybe a bit less ashiness than you would from from the Highlands. Yeah, but uh, you know, Distillery 29, a big favourite with our members, so uh, I'm sure there's more love it than hate it, like you say, Ian. Yeah, well I was going to say as well, if we're talking about lighter options, there's one lightly peated uh, flavor profile on here, and it's pretty unexpected. It's cask number one dot two eight one. Yeah. Um, so it's a second fill barrel that, on its first filling, had uh, Isla malt from distillery number three, which is kind of in the middle of the the peat spectrum on Isla as well. It's quite a delicate floral, um, very kind of measured peat. So here you've got Speyside whiskey, which was in a bourbon barrel beforehand. Um, then it's got this, these delicate notes that were enough to push it into the lightly peated profile. I think you just need to spend time when you've got a, an ex-peated cask because it's not quite as overt. Um, but, you know, this will really come alive with a bit of water and a bit of time. Yeah, and this definitely ticks the thinking differently box. I, I'm not sure I'm familiar with peated bottlings from this distillery. No. Is it? They don't exist. They don't. Yeah, I was wondering. Do, do, have they existed, or is this <laughs> no, is this, this is a society first? It maybe maybe decades ago when it was you know quite common for everybody to use peat, but certainly not recognised as a house style. I wouldn't not in the not in the last century or so. Yeah, yeah, and interesting because obviously this is where the society started with. You know, the first distillery we bottled from, a sherry, a classic sherried cask from this distillery, number one. Uh, and here we are 40 years later with a lightly peated bottling from the same distillery. So, yeah, sounds intriguing, that's for sure. Um, for those who aren't so focused on peat, whether it's uh, the heavy variety or, or lighter, uh, a nice selection of juicy oak and vanilla in the March outturn. What, what caught your eye there, Julian? 
uh, if you're referring to the 89.19, mm. that is one to look out for. One, the panel was quite fond of it, I believe. And secondly, it's a second fill heavy toast medium char cask, which at first still have a tendency to be extremely active. But the second fill is much mellower, but still provides a lot of extractives. And you can, you can tell by the profile you're buying on it with juicy oak vanilla. This is what, what you're buying. So lots of um, rich, juicy notes, so fruity and a lot of uh, treacle in there to be had as well. And a uh, 41164 caught my eye, uh, dark and spicy, it's called, uh, from a chinkapin oak cask. I've seen chinkapin with, well, Rassi have been working with chinkapin and, you know, we've seen some bottlings. What's chinkapin all about? Yeah, so we did a um, a small batch as well called pomegranate gremolata that used this cask type. Um, so this is a pretty interesting comparison, actually, as well. You've got first fill, some more more active oak, it's a barrel, so slightly smaller than the 89, uh, 19 hogshead. Uh, but the chinkapin um, is interesting for white oak. It's a different species, Quercus mullenbergi. Mm. Um, and it gives, it can give like sort of brambly, dark, fruity notes. Um, whereas, you know, American oak, we're, norm- we're, we're used to that kind of vanilla, tonka bean, coconut, toasty thing, which is still there in the chinkapin, but it... It just has a really nice, slightly darker profile, I think. So to compare those two would be would be a good exercise, I would suggest. Yeah, very nice. And uh, another looks like another nice bottling from Distillery 39 there as well, Julian. Yeah, so your first fill barrel for 39276, which yielded a really, really fragrant whiskey. Um, I'm looking forward to this one as actually because the um, juicy organa of that description and of that age are usually a really nice uh, type of whiskey to herald spring or at, at least the end of winter. Yeah, 39 is a lovely distillate. I always get stone fruits, peaches, plums, that kind of uh, that kind of vibe from it. So just straight up first fill bourbon is a great way to present it, I think. Yeah, it's classic. Uh, don't think you can go too far wrong with our, our 39s. Uh, some, an interesting offering from 44, one of my favourite distilleries, just because it's, it's a bit mental sometimes, and this looks like it could be a, a quite mad. It's a technical term. Yeah, a bit mental. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the way I like my whiskey. It certainly not like it's going to be interesting with a, a refill number four char barrel. And I think, you know, sometimes these 44s do need a bit of char uh, or a bit of extra char to come into their own. Um, just because, you know, it's a, it's a warm tub using distillery and sometimes the, the distillate can be meaty enough that you need either a lot more time or a bit more wood to sort of balance things out. Yeah. Yeah, always worth checking out the 44s. So that's... Uh... These, the cask that this was in, I remember buying it in 2015. So we imported that from a cooperage in the US that used to be based in Glasgow. Okay. Um, and yeah, so it was made to our recipe uh, from wine grade wood, 24 month air seasoned to develop the flavours in the oak. And we put toasted heads on the end as well for some extra oomph. So while it's, I think it will be maybe its third use, um, there's still plenty of flavour to uh, to contribute from that. Yeah, so 2015, you're talking about uh, eight years old, really, that cask. Yeah, it's kind of still a first fill in, in yeah. a sense because it's it's within a window of, you know, a, yeah. a young, mature whisky of eight years. So, yeah. All right, kaleidoscopic contemplation, one to look out for as well. Uh, what What is this 53, Ewan? Because it says a, a two to one mm-hmm. uh, what, what's going on with this? So we took two hogsheads, uh, bourbon, and popped them together into a first fill butt um, that we had sourced from a bodega. So this is, as opposed to being a seasoned sherry cask, um, this is one that was kind of retired from 
a bodega after a period of making sherry for you know a few good few decades. So the influence is a bit lighter. It's quite kind of saline and. Um, there's some fruitiness there, but it's a it's a really different view into what an old sherry cask can be like yeah. uh, compared to some of the seasoned ones that we use. And is this uh, first as well? This kind of process of of uh, putting two hogsheads into a sherry butt? No, we've done this previously. Um, so we did some, I think, for the gathering in I want to say 2020. Uh-huh. It was a couple of sherry butts from Distillery Seven that were two or three barrels. Uh, bourbon barrels mixed together into sherry butts uh, for two, three years, and then we bottled those. So we're doing a bit of this behind the scenes. Um, they don't come out that often, but we'll, we're building up a bit of a pipeline of them. Got the record. Was it not this way number nine? No, it was no. Uh, called Twinning. I want to say it's 7.243. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was, was good. It, was it seven? Yeah. That was really good. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. And there yeah. was one other one that I can never remember the name of, but it would have been a number either side ah, of that. yes. I think it might be the one. Ah, That's ah, a 24-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> that was the name of it? Yeah. Ah, yeah. I thought you were just saying, ah, yes. <laughs> it was my uh, farewell bottle from the marketing section. Ah, okay. <laughs> long, long gone, I take it. No. Still on the shelf. I've not, ah. No, not, not had the opportunity to. Oh, you've got plenty of whiskey on the shelf to, to get through, so... Uh, that's one to look forward to um, and then something else different to me anyway is B4.4 a, a bourbon uh, from a, a 30 gallon or quarter cask so that sounds like an interesting one yeah so standard barrel uh, in America would be 53 gallons so around about 200 litre so this is smaller, maybe it's 120, 125, something like that. Uh, you can see there the outturn of 90 bottles. Yeah. So this is rare as hen's teeth. Um, also, it's pretty old for a bourbon matured in a, in a smaller barrel uh, in the US as well from Chicago. Um, so really, really intense called Turn Up That Dial, which kind of says it all. It's, it's a really intense experience but thoroughly enjoyable yeah uh, moving into our kind of spicy and dry spicy and well we've only got one spicy and dry that I see here uh, from our old favourite distillery 35 but more in our spicy and sweet flavour profile category uh, coming out in March uh, anything there that catches your eyes Julian? so for the spicy and dry the Glen Murray yeah it's a Sorry. So the, for the 35355. Everyone knows it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so 35, <laughs> I three, didn't five, even five, realize right. yeah. Um, yeah, so for that 35355, you, you get this thing that happens, which is having a bourbon cask in a first fill configuration that you would fully expect would yield juicy oak vanilla as a profile or sweet, fruity, and mellow, but you end up with a spicy and dry profile. And this is always the thing that asks the question, where was that cask before? How was it coopered? And which bourbon was it used for? Because all these bourbon distilleries have their own requirements and their own recipes for their cask. One bourbon barrel does not equal one bourbon barrel, Mm. so to speak. So it's an interesting one because this shows that this, this, this cask has been on a slightly different journey than what you would expect. And if you look at um, the uh, title of that cask, which is Orange Rheinberg Digestif, um, it, or Digestif, uh, this kind of suggests that there's quite a bit of herbal components to it. And this does happen now and then with, with, with the wood that gives a bit of a drier, um, a drier impression. So yeah, that's probably one you would want for a a nice um, hill walk or a nice walk. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Task. And a first bottling from Japan for a while? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I won't bore you with tales of global shipping, but mm. um, but yeah, this one is, um, is absolutely fantastic. Uh, these are always eagerly awaited and, you know, this distillery is doing some great things. Uh, quite exciting that they've got 
a new site as well or a new distillery that they're able to ramp up uh, production um, yeah I mean what what more to say it's going to be quite rich and exotic it's probably one of the older ones that uh, we've bottled from, from this distillery as well I think around nine years old um, yeah very exciting yeah sings like summer that is a uh, bottling 130.7 from Japan so yeah Definitely one to look out for. A uh, couple of interesting uh, wine casks as well coming out in March with uh, 13105 and 94.38. We've got uh, a Cosecha cask and then uh, an ex bodega cask from, from a place that we've got good memories of, Ewan. Yes, absolutely. This is a, a lovely... Uh, small bodega that's in the ninth generation now of the family um, people often are asking what what does cosecha refer to because it just means harvest yeah. and I think a lot of uh, different wines would, would use that term but it's not a category in itself however the bodega produces a wine that they call that so that, that's what we went with as the cast type, it's kind of a more of a like maybe a musket um, you know, it's like a, quite a sweet peachy yeah. poached pear style. Um, so that's lovely. But then the other one, so that's 13105. And then the other one, 9438. So same bodega, but this is from uh, their Pedro Jimenez Solera. Ah, so, okay. So these are both from yeah. that, that same bodega. Yeah, absolutely. So for the Coseca one, is that still all Pedro Jimenez wine? Yes, for Pedro, Pedro Jimenez grapes. grapes. Yeah, yes, but a very different style. So they produce everything from a, as you know very well, one of your favourite wines, <laughs> um, a kind of drier white wine, yeah. right the way through this, the the scale of um, of sherry to they do a kind of Olorosa style, but made from Pedro Jimenez grapes, and then the big dark syrupy Pedro Jimenez as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and this is an amazing winery, really, because they work exclusively with the Pedro Jimenez grape, but it's not all the thick, sweet, syrupy, raisiny uh, wine that we associate instinctively with Pedro Jimenez. Uh, the, what, what they get out of that grape is astonishing. Yeah, so they're one of the few that grow and dry the grapes in Jerez as well, because a lot of the grapes for Pedro Jimenez are grown in the Montilla region so this is definitely quite an anomaly um, in, a, in the best possible way so yeah some great casks from them yeah nice to see those casks going on to another life uh, with society whiskey in them uh, another interesting cask there uh, Julien the 128.30 uh, with a, a, a muscat of Setubal what are we talking about there uh, the it's, it's a muscat wine, so you were getting into a slightly woodier, more resinous type of wine, uh, still quite sweet. Um, but yeah, I think the although the cask is interesting, even more interesting here is it's probably the the stir it comes from and the type of still it was made in. Um, I was so one two eight is a Welsh distillery. And they use a Faraday still, which is a sort of odd contraption halfway between a column and a pot still. And it produces a very sort of very high ABV spirit, which they re sort of dilute before putting them putting it into cask. But it is extremely, extremely fruity. It's very, very light, very fruity spirit. And it does really well in uh, in wine casks. Their standard expression uh, is actually also in wine cask or wine so finish anyway. Um, in Madeira, uh, cask. Did, did you not visit there recently as well? Yeah, I was there in, uh, over the Christmas break. Yeah, I just nice. uh, yeah, and we'll kind of look forward to the future as they've they've installed two pot stills in their distillery recently. And it's a, it's a really nice comparison. I think down the line we're going to see still that very fruity style, but with a bit more of a Scottish DNA in it, you could say. 
Yeah. So they've been kind of blazing the trail for Welsh whisky, haven't they? They were the first distillery or new distillery to open up there, and they're opening a second one now. Yeah, that's Welsh, right. So yeah, and and the whole the whole scene is kind of burst into life uh, in Wales. Okay, that looks interesting. Anything else that catches your eye, Ewan? No. No. <laughs> that's, that's enough. Uh, for me, the, the 9277 was uh, worthy of note. I think it's been mentioned before, but this entire batch of uh, this three number nine from September 2003, or specifically 11th of September 2003, is ever so slightly peated, um, okay. which is not a characteristic that one usually associates to that distillery. But it so happened that this batch was, and we were lucky enough to acquire quite a few casks of it. So it's it's a slightly different look at what the this distillery usually does, and you can see that it's the, the peat is subtle enough that this lands into the sweet, fruity, and mellow profile so it's not by any means a pr prominent feature but it just really helps the entire whiskey to come together as as more than the sum of its parts and I think this was this was well recognized by uh, by the panel yeah and again as you say Julian it's not a style that we necessarily associate with distillery number nine classic Speyside but uh, must have been something going on on the 11th of September 2003. There's this kind of yeah, PT influence. One of the distillers was just being a maverick, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that's, that, that pretty much covers it in terms of uh, some of the highlights. But these are going to be released in the UK from Friday the 3rd of March. Uh, not all on the same day. Uh, we're, we're releasing some of these bottles through the course of March but uh, look out for them uh, and certainly in terms of thinking differently I think there's some some great examples of whiskies that just are are so unusual or the first time that we've done certain things so lots to explore and enjoy so thank you gents for your time thank, thank you. you Richard good to catch up and uh, uh, enjoy your March out -turn.